Welcome to the webinar, Streamlining and Democratizing Functional Testing by Flow Cytometry, presented by Jean-Marc Bunel from Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. This webinar will cover allergy testing with streamlined basophil activation testing and flow cytometry-based functional assays for the characterization of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. Today's presenter, Jean-Marc Bunel, joined Beckman Coulter Life Sciences in 2009 after a PhD at the ESTCI in Paris and a postdoctoral period at the EPFL in Switzerland, both in the field of proteomics and metabolomics. Since then, Jean-Marc held various R&D positions dealing with a variety of techniques such as automation, capillary electrophoresis, mass spectrometry, and flow cytometry. Today, Jean-Marc works as a senior staff research scientist and together with his team, works on the development of new approaches where democratization of flow cytometry could help answer complex biological questions. A link to today's recording of this webinar will be provided to all participants. You can find additional flow cytometry resources on floorfinder.com, including a unique antibody search platform and a comprehensive flow cytometry panel design tool. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat feature and we will address them at the end of this webinar as time permits. And with that, I'll hand it over to John Mark Bunnell. John uh, Mark, we'll take just a second here to get you control of the screen, and you should be good to go. Thank you. Is that okay now? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. So, before Getting started, I would like to um, first introduce uh, a technology that you, uh, we believe uh, an amazing technology in our world to uh, bring some more expert uh, flow cytometry to the, to the people here. And this technology is uh, related to a new region, uh, technology, a new region format. It does, um, it is a, a region format that doesn't only rely uh, technology that enable us to prepare um, well uh, stable uh, regions but in, even beyond this this uh, technology enable us to, uh, to streamline workflow this is uh, a technology that is different from lyophilization or typical freeze drying and this in a different um, area first of all it is uh, not a lyophilization case that you uh, you end up with but more uh, something like a, a coat layer at the bottom of, of the tube. So this is something really sturdy that is not prone to, to static discharges. And this uh, format brings uh, the technology, the stability we need to, uh, to, to, to democratize our, our, our procedure forward. So there is indeed a variety of reasons why we, we love this, uh, this technology at Beckman Coulter. First of all, as I did tell you, it does provide uh, an excellent stability at room temperature, which means that you do not need to uh, control temperature during shipment, but neither during storage uh, once it has reached your, your laboratory. The shelf life is uh, rather expanded and it is beyond 12 months of, uh, of, of stability, which brings uh, uh, an additional uh, robustness to, to the essay. This is not only about stability, really one uh, additional reason why we like this format of ready to use and room temperature stable uh, format regions is uh, because it gives us the possibility to, uh, to simplify drastic and complex workflows. And doing that, we believe that this can help us democratize difficult procedures, but also to improve the robustness. This uh, simplification of the workflows together with this increased stability provides a uh, large uh, essay robustness together with a large uh, essay portability, which is ideal for multi-center studies, for example. We have been working on this technology for the past five or six years, and uh, this enables us to, to develop uh, a variety of panels that are currently being commercialized and, and available uh, as products. This uh, product and panel uh, address a lot of uh, the current needs, for basic immune system research, you do have here a variety of, uh, of panels that are available and that enable you to, 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 to do in-depth fitness typing with this ready to use and room temperature stable format. We do also have uh, a variety of essays that are more directed towards cytokine production, for example, and that have 
to be used together with uh, simulator tubes, which are prepared in the same uh, format as really parachute stable uh, reagents. So uh, now we can go more into the, the details and why we believe or what we're trying to do to, uh, to bring uh, further uh, functional testing by flow cytometry. There is uh, many reasons for, for that, but first of all, uh, we have to realize that this kind of functional flow cytometry is a re really powerful approach to gather uh, really important insights into a complex biological system that can be useful not only for fundamental research, but clinical research also down the road. All of this information being uh, gathered at a cell level. Uh, the downside with this kind of flow cytometry based functional essay is that those involve a lot of different variables, and as such, they are uh, highly prone to, to variabilities. There is also one uh, limitation of most of the functional laces being performed as of today. Uh, this is related to, to the sample they are using. And uh, in most of the cases, these workflows rely on the use of uh, PBMCs. Why we, we believe and why it is usually acknowledged that all blood can bring most, uh, more, much more informative uh, patients. This is really the, the, the sample that brings the, the biggest potential. So our endeavor in that, uh, in that context is to try to, to develop synthesize and highly standardized workflow so that the full potential of this uh, functional testing by flow cytometry could, could be uh, fully honest and that it could be, it could be bring, brought beyond uh, long-term uh, advocate or expert laboratories. First of all, I would like to, to share a few examples that we've been uh, working through uh, these, uh, these, um, our activities in the last few years. A few examples that show how diverse the question can be uh, when using uh, these kind of functional flow cytometry approaches. First of all, on the top left of the screen, you can see a simple example where an activator um, constituted by PNA, genomycin, and Brussel DNA has been used to uh, study the cytokine production and thus the TH1, TH2, TH17 balance uh, with, um, by looking at the cytokine production at the lymphocyte level. And you can see that the cytokines being involved in that case were interferon gamma, IL-17, and IL-4. You do have another example here that is more related to uh, a question close to the ICRIG syndrome detection. And in that case, the same activator, PNA unomycin, uh, has been used, the difference being that no withholding was added, so that activation marker at the extracellular level could be, uh, could be monitored during the activation. In that case, this is both CD69 and CD154 activation markers that are being followed. We then also look at other uh, populations, such as monocytes, uh, thanks to uh, an activator composed of LPS and withholding A, in that case again. And in that case, the idea of um, the, the underlying question behind this essay was related to the ability of patients under septic shock to uh, produce a lot of TNS alpha. So this was a research project in collaboration with um, collaborators from the Lyon University. And we could see that this simple essay could help uh, to could potentially be a, a, a biomarker for patients on the septic uh, detection. And finally, you can have another kind of functional essay that we've been also working with in the past, again, at the research uh, level. And this was related to uh, the IL2 simulation of uh, a CDMT or all blood um, sample. And the underlying um, uh, question or concept that uh, this was addressing was related to uh, ILT uh, therapeutic uh, IL-2 therapeutic approaches in the field of autoimmune diseases. And uh, what we wanted to see was the dose um, specificity between T-Rex or non-T-Rex uh, activation of, uh, of non-T-Rex T-cell uh, activation. So this was an early example for us to, to play with 
uh, these uh, new uh, dry activator and dry uh, panels, I could say. And we did use this uh, similar uh, concept to, to work on uh, other questions. And the uh, first application I would like to, to speak about today is basophil activation testing. So as a way to get started, I just want to, uh, to introduce a little bit the field of allergy testing and uh, what are the, tr the current tools for that. So without going much into details, we do have in vivo testing for allergy testing. And we do also have a variety of in vitro, in vitro tools that are available. In vitro, we do have specific IgE or specific IgG4 uh, titers that are uh, mainly being used. But we have also here a flow cytometry technique that uh, focuses on the basophil activation upon um, incubation with potential allergenic uh, extract. This uh, approach is, is unique because it is cell-based, it is a functional approach, and the last reason why it is really, really unique, it is, at least in this allergy testing landscape, it is because it relies on uh, old blood. And uh, doing so, or relying on old blood, the beauty is that you do not only look at uh, cell response, but you also look at uh, the old environment containing other soluble materials such as cytokines, metabolites, or immunoglobulin, which are all very important in the field of allergy. Uh, there is also a, a lot of literature during the last years that are truly advocating for more heavier use of BAT in the field of uh, allergy testing uh, research. However, as of today, these tools remain uh, an expert tool and uh, has a difficulty to spread, to spread beyond expert uh, laboratory. So I won't go much into the details, but just want to, uh, to, uh, to remind what is this test about. So it is simply about mixing uh, a basophil containing sample, which can be a PBNC, a basophil preparation or all blood in our cases, together with potential allergen. After a short incubation time, we will then look at potential activation marker at the surface of the basophils, and thanks to that, we will be able to um, characterize the activation phenotype of basophils. This is what uh, a typical uh, basophil uh, activation testing workflow looks like. So again, I won't go really uh, into the into the into the details of this workflow, but what I would like to, to share is that this is a pretty complex workflow, not only containing a lot of different pipetting uh, steps, um, so that you can add your staining region, but also add a potential uh, activation buffer or the different allergens or the concentration you like to, to use them, but those also contain washing or fortification steps before finally uh, conducting the flow cytometry analysis. So this is a, a pretty complex. What we did do was to transfer all of the staining region to a dry and ready to use room temperature stable format. And this enabled us to uh, drastically simplify the, the basophil activation testing workflow. So the workflow as, um, as it has been optimized is, uh, is, is the following. You do take your ready to use dry region cube and then you will add your blood together with um, the allergen that you would like to, to test. For the for the for the for, for the sample you're, you're considering, this allergen will be diluted in PBS or in a calcium-containing activation buffer as a function of working with heparin or EDTA anticoagulate blood. And then, after this solution has been added into the tube, you will simply vortex uh, the content of the tube for a few seconds and then incubate for 15 minutes at 37 degrees. During this incubation, both staining and activation will, um, will, be, uh, will, be, will be going on. And then after this time, you will simply need to lyse your red blood cells before going into the, the flow cytometer uh, analysis. So as you can see, this is a no-wash approach. As compared to the previous workflow, it only contains four uh, different pipetting steps. It uh, does uh, need less than 40 minutes to be, uh, to be performed in its entirety. And this is really important that it is a compensation free uh, panel. And this, even though five different colors are being used in this, uh, in this panel, 
And finally, as you will see later, uh, a big advantage of this uh, streamlined version is that it can be automated, automated and even transposed to a 96 word plate format if needed. The gating approach is the following. We first identify the local site, thanks to CD4510. We then exclude the T cell. And then, focusing on the low SS uh, population, we can identify the basophils with a positive TRTH2 staining. The activation phenotype of the basophils is finally being characterized, looking at both CD203C and CD63 activation markers. You can see here an example of what a negative control and what a positive control look like. We have everything now into a dry and uh, ready to use um, region format. One of the, of the of the biggest advantages is not only to simplify the, the workflow, but really to, to increase the robustness of the other OSA. And this is illustrated by this slide. On this slide, you can see uh, two, uh, two different graphics uh, illustrating the level of variability that is encountered with this, um, with this kind of testing, in the case of only negative and positive control here. If I take the, the experiment that was aimed at assessing the interoperator uh, variability, you can see that the coefficient of variation on all of the gated population is really low. Even for the basophil, this is below 6% uh, CV. So this really illustrates the standardization capability of the dry and room temperature stable uh, format in the case of uh, flow cytometry functional anything. Uh, the way it is being done is the following. Uh, you have, of course, a negative control and then a positive control. And between these two, you can see the, uh, the drastic difference between uh, CD2F3C and CD63. But then what the way it is typically being uh, implemented is through a dose response approach. And here, in the case of the peanut allergic donor, you can see what the result looks like as a function of the concentration of peanut extract in the tube at the activation level. And you can see that from this, we can draw a nice dose response curve that enables us uh, a detailed characterization of the sample we're working with. So this uh, streamlined basophil activation testing workload is now part of the Duraclone portfolio, if I can say, and is available for ordering through the typical uh, approaches. The format is the following. This is 25 negative or test tubes plus five positive controls. So these five positive controls not only contain the same lesions in the dry and room temperature stable format, but also an anti-IgE antibody that enables to cross-link um, IgE uh, at the surface of the basophil, and therefore the, um, the, um, the acquisition of the positive control tube. So again, this is a no-wash approach that doesn't require any compensation before being uh, interpreted. And this is uh, made possible by the careful uh, design of, uh, of the panel, where all of the same regions have been, uh, have been well distributed among the three lasers available in a typical 8 to 10 color uh, flow, cytometry, uh, flow cytometer configuration. It is compatible with both heparin and EDT uh, anticoagulated blood. And, uh, and this is this streamlined uh, solution that uh, we wanted to push forward. It is important because it potentially helps us um, facilitate studies that aim at assessing further the, the potential relevance of basophil activation testing in clinical research. And just as a way to, uh, to illustrate what, what we're doing in this, in this field, I wanted to share a few slides about the clinical study that we're uh, taking part in. In, uh, thanks to a collaboration that we're having with uh, the University of People here in, in Marseille, in the south of France. The, the question uh, that this uh, clinical study tried to answer is whether the number of OIC challenges can be, uh, can, be, can be decreased thanks to a potential use, of course, down the road in the future, of uh, basophil activation testing as a potential surrogate method. This is, of course, a research a research stage uh, study, and this is uh, a few preliminary data that I wanted to share with you uh, today. 
So first of all, and this is just uh, an example of the kind of information we can uh, we can we can gather with this kind of uh, of facing. So here you can see what uh, the dose response look like in the case of 23 different peanut allergic uh, donor. So what you can see in that case is that for a given uh, kind of extract that has uh, that has been used. You can see how much the dose response varies from one donor to the other. What is interesting is to see the heterogeneity in terms of EC50. You have very early um, EC50, and then you can see how spread they are in this um, in this um, allergenic extract uh, concentration uh, range. They are basically spanning among uh, four different orders of magnitude. What we can see as well is an interagenity in the amplitude of response. You do have some um, some donor that responds with a very high amplitude and some other that do respond with a pretty low uh, amplitude and some other that are all really positive even from really, really low uh, allergenic extract concentration. And finally, you can see also a strong heterogeneity in the behavior of at high dose of, uh, of allergen. You can see some dose response that basically go up and saturate and remain at the top, and some other that present the typical bell-shaped um, profile that we expect from this kind of experiment. What is important is to um, to look at each patient's initial referential. Uh, this is uh, the reason for that is that. Basophil activation testing and the reactivity of the basophils is highly dependent on the on the patient. And what it is what is interesting to see is that this kind of uh, amplitude is really donor specific. So in that case, this is again the same uh, patient, the same donor that were considered on the slide uh, on the slide before. And you can see how much the negative control is different from the positive control for each of these different um, donors. For some of the sample, you can see that the difference between the negative and the positive control is almost uh, nothing, or at least it's really diminished. And this is something that we um, that we know as low responder or even non responder basophil um, samples or patients in uh, in some cases. And what is interesting is that these three uh, donors that are basically bracketed in green correspond to the same journal. And what what comes from this slide is that this behavior, this ex vivo reactivity is truly donor specific and that it seems to be um, consistent from one time to the other. So this is more related to a, a status than uh, anything else. In a, so considering this heterogeneity or in ex vivo reactivity, it is sometimes important to normalize the data that you're gathering through basophil activation testing. To do so, we basically consider the negative control and the highest uh, reactive, uh, reacting uh, tubes in a dose response, and these highest reacting uh, dose or tubes can be either specific control or an allergen tube at a given concentration. And once we consider these negative and these highest reactive uh, tubes, we can normalize the data so that the dose response for each of the of the donor can truly go from zero to, to one. And this is really a way to, to, to facilitate the characterization of um, of, uh, of, uh, of the behavior of the different donor. And for example, here you can see this donor that was almost showing no reactivity in the non-normalized data. And when you do normalize data, you can see that there is indeed a dose a reactive uh, pattern, a dose response pattern. And this is important for the kind of questions that are being asked in this kind of cases. Another question that has been uh, shown uh, during the recent literature in the in the context of basophil activation uh, testing, the question was related to the use of uh, DAT as a potential biomarker for patients under uh, immunotherapy testing, and uh, and the question, or at least one of the DAT was was assessed together with other techniques as potential biomarker. In our case, in our end. We do have several donors that have been sampled several times during the, the clinical study. And what you can see here is the same donor 
at one time point and at another time point here. And what you can see is that this patient does show a significant shift in EC50. And what, what was interesting was that this patient was under allergen-based immunotherapy. And looking at this, uh, at this data, at his preliminary and discussing with the clinical staff at the, at the hospital, it seems that this behavior truly makes sense uh, considering the observation they did at the, at the, at the individual level. So in the, in the context of uh, basophil activation testing, the conclusion uh, that we reached so, so far and the, the different perspectives that we have at the moment are, are, are the following. First of all, we did show that it is possible to streamline the ATSA and to develop an approach that has not only the potential to facilitate and standardize the ATSA through uh, different laboratories, but we believe that this approach can also be a tool to democratize the ATSA and to spread this important technique uh, beyond expert laboratories. We do have preliminary clinical results that does uh, suggest that our streamlined BAT uh, platform can be used uh, to provide valuable input to uh, characterize and stratify allergy patients. But of course, this will have to be uh, confirmed and further demonstrated through uh, additional data and collaboration that we will be uh, performing in the future. What I did um, alleviate to at the, at the beginning of the talk, and this is something I want to, uh, to add this part on basophil activation testing with, was potential transposition to the 96 template format. Indeed, now that everything is available in this dry and room temperature stable format, and that the workflow that has been developed doesn't present any centrifugation step, we are willing to our ability to transpose it to, uh, to the 96 well place format. The reason for that was to provide not only a miniaturized approach, but also a uh, much higher stream, streamlining property so that flexibility and could be, um, could, be, um, could be modulated as a function of the needs of the, of the uh, different laboratories. What is also important to consider is that in that case, not only staining regions have been dry and formatted in this dry and room temperature stable format, but we're also showing that we can dry together with this, our flow cytometric region the allergenic extract. In that case, doing so, we do have fully to use Dura plates that simply needs to be put on an uh, automation format, uh, automation platform such as uh, Biomech and XP in that case. And after the, the routine has been performed by the, the biomech without intervention from the from um, from the user, the blade can simply broke and analyze on the flow cytometer equipped with a with a blade loader. In that case that was a cytoplate. And here you can see how the basophil phenotype evolved as a function of the concentration of the allergenic extract. And you can see the kind of dose response curve that can be obtained with this miniaturized and even more streamlined BHT approach. So in that case, we're able to decrease really strongly the sample, the blood, the amount of blood required to draw a dose response. And we can also uh, dramatically decrease the end time time so that a technician in the lab can be free up, uh, in, to do other things, other uh, other approaches, and of course the uh, the expectation as well is that the robustness can be um, can be uh, of a uh, very good level, taking advantage of the information on top of the revision format. So this is ending my part on the basophil activation testing, and now what I would like to um, to share with you is some results that we've been um, obtaining in another field. And this field uh, also deals with uh, flow cytometry based functional assays. But in that case, the question that were asked were more in relation to the characterization of therapeutic uh, antibodies. So, um, without spending much time on the introduction, uh, I can state that we've been um, witnessing over the last few years uh, a significant rise of uh, therapeutics on the, on the market. And there are, there are many, many reasons for, for that, especially their efficacy and so on. But what we can say, at least from our end, trying to develop approaches to, to characterize this, uh, this molecule, is that a multitude of mechanisms of actions are being um, 
possible thanks to uh, therapeutics antibodies. And also what, we, what we're currently seeing is that uh, increase in the range of complexity of the molecules that are being developed. This is, we now have not only a typical uh, monoclonal antibody, we also have glyco-engineered antibody, we do have antibody drug uh, conjugate, and we also have bispecific uh, antibodies coming up, for example. Uh, in spite of this um, really great efficacy that has been witnessed and that keeps to be uh, demonstrated through a variety of clinical uh, studies, there are currently a lot of challenges in this field. First of all, from a clinical standpoint, if you are uh, a doctor trying to, for example, or willing to use an anti-TNF drug for a given pathology, you do not have only one molecule to use, but you have several molecules to, to choose from. So the question now that is being asked by the clinician is how do they choose the, 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 the best therapeutics for a given individual? So the question of patient certification for treatment personalization is being asked. And this is not only to, uh, to choose or to identify the drug that is um, the most efficient for this, uh, for this patient, but this is also about choosing the drug that is um, that has the least potential for side effects. So this is from the clinical standpoint. Now from a biopharmaceutical standpoint or a more uh, society uh, standpoint, um, question related to potentially decreasing the development cost of this uh, of this molecule are being asked, and uh, the bigger question is how do we make uh, available to uh, to the highest number of people this highly efficient drug. And in that context, we do have biosimilars that are, for example, being uh, developed over the last few years. But a remaining question in that field is how do we actually establish comparability? So in our case, trying to tackle or to, uh, to get a, a fit in this um, in this uh, in this area, we started with uh, the anti C20 uh, family. So this is an interesting family because they are currently a variety of molecules that are currently approved, so either originator or biosimilar or even biobatter. And you also have more molecules that are currently being developed. These molecules on type CD20 maps are being used for a variety of pathologies, for example, B cell related pathologies, but also autoimmune uh, pathologies. Another interesting uh, feature of this molecule is that they do uh, work through a variety of mechanisms of action, and those are well uh, illustrated on this uh, on this scheme. You, for example, have antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity, but you also have complement dependent uh, cell cytotoxicity, and then for type two on type D20 antibody, you also have direct cell lysis uh, mechanisms of action. So this heterogeneity uh, makes the characterization of this molecule even more difficult or even more challenging. So in our case, the experimental strategy that we did use to tackle these uh, potential challenges was the following. So we did um, assess our ability to develop uh, two different functional tests, or at least to, to develop to demonstrate the feasibility of these two uh, functional tests. So the first test was designed around a B cell depletion and the NK cell uh, activation. So the idea was to uh, design a panel around the ADCC mechanism. The second uh, panel that we've been working on was a panel uh, dedicated to uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine production. And in both cases, the initial first step consisted in incubating the whole blood of a donor together with the therapeutic of, uh, of choice or the therapeutics considered in the, in the experiment. This is, these are the composition of the two panels that we've been using in this, uh, in this study. So on the top with the extracellular panel, you can see uh, first all the gating markers, so CD45, CD14, 19, 66, and 3, that basically enable us to identify all the immune cells of interest. And then bracketed in red, you can see all the different activation markers that we've been, we've been using in that case. So uh, CD16, CD69, but also CD178, CD54, and CD137. 
On the bottom, you can see the composition of the uh, second panel dedicated to uh, the study of uh, production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So in that case as well, you, read, you do have the, the same backbone uh, to get the different cells of interest, and then you do have four different uh, cytokines that are being created in that case, interferon gamma, uh, IL-8, IL-6, and GNF alpha. This is uh, the, the workflow that has been uh, optimized for the extracellular approach. As you can see, as in the case of the biofuel activation testing, this is a pretty uh, simple workflow, and this was very important for us to, to, um, to assess our ability to perform really simple workflow in that case as well, because uh, streamlining uh, an ACCO plate transposition are also a bit of interest to us when we're dealing with this, uh, with this topic. So everything does start with the therapeutic tube in which you also have the CD107A, and then you can add your 50 microliters of blood required to, uh, you know, uh, that is considered in your experience. After an incubation period ranging from 4 to 20 hours, we can then um, add all of our other markers into the same um, into the same tube so that uh, the different staining can uh, can happen and finally we do like the red blood cells using optimized T here uh, here as well. So first of all, uh, the gating approach and uh, how does the 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 result look like? So here you can see uh, the FS CD45 uh, dual plot first of all. So you can see a um, pattern that is quite um, quite uh, unique, if I can say, and the reason for that is that these samples have been incubated for more than 20 hours or 37 degrees. So the nice SSC before style that's really to, 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 to see uh, with um, those activation is sometimes a bit more difficult after long incubation period. However, this does not hinder uh, the identification of the population of interest. Here you have the B cells, identified and then the NK cells identified. So first of all, how can we use this, uh, this assay to assess the function of, uh, of a monoclonal? Here you can see in the first line the result that I've obtained, that has been obtained without any monoclonal in the incubation mixture. So first of all, you can see the B cell amount at about 90% in, uh, in that case. And then if we focus on the NK cell, you can see the activation phenotype with CD16, CD69, 107A, 137, and 54. The biggest difference that you can see when an anti-CD20 therapeutic mass um, is added together with the blood are the following. First of all, you can see that uh, B cell depletion happened in this uh, in this sample. The percentage of B cell went from 9% down to about 5%, and you can see how the MSI of the B cells have been deteriorated through this incubation period. Then, if you focus on the NK cell, you can first see that the CD16 and the CD69 of the NK cells have been uh, significantly changed with the CD16. Uh, decreasing and the CD69 increasing. The CD16 truly show that these NK cells have been engaged to uh, the, IG, the FC portion of the IgG1 uh, therapeutics, and then the 69 even more uh, demonstrate that the NK cells have been activated. And this activation can also be characterized with CD107A, 137, and 54. You may wonder about the orthogonality or the complementarity of these three markers. So here there is some hints about, uh, about this. With these, all, uh, with these three different drug plots, illustrating the different combination that we can have with these three different uh, activation um, mm -hmm. markers. And what you can see is that there is not only your uh, positive cells, but you have uh, all the combination uh, represented by the by the NK cell population, which means that each of these activation markers does bring some information on the table. But then, if you uh, if we plot the the, the percentage of uh, all the different phenotypes as a function of the CD16 negative, CD69 positive uh, NK cell phenotype, we can see that the 107A is certainly the marker that is the most closely related to the ADCC mechanism. 
Now, if you use a uh, different molecule, we, no, now we did use different molecules to assess whether this approach could be used to uh, characterize mechanisms of action of a uh, different molecule. So here you can see the results when no monoclonal antibody are present in the blood during the incubation period. Then you can see the result that are obtained when taximab is being added to the to the blood, and finally what is obtained when obinutuzumab is being used to, to the blood. First of all, if you uh, focus on the diesel uh, amount, you can see that those are ranging from 10.5 down to 5 percent in each of the of the of the of the situation with the different therapeutics, which means that the depletion level is of about the same uh, the same magnitude with the two uh, antibodies that have been used. But then what is interesting to look at is the level of NK cell activation. What you can see with the rituximab is that no significant activation of the NK cells can be detected. While a strong NK cell activation is observed in the case of the obinutuzumab. And this is actually in agreement together in, in agreement with the literature because the obinutuzumab is a glycoengineered antibody and is an acid modulated FC uh, portion, which presents the ability to engage in case also for donor, no matter what their uh, CD16 genotype would be. While in the case of the Tuxima, you may have a difference in uh, your in the ability of the antibody to engage in case cells as a function of the CD16 genotype. And this is well illustrated in, in that case. So these results were in agreement with the literature and truly show that we're able to bring a lot of information with this kind of flow cytometry based functional agent. We also assessed whether these approaches could be used in a post degradation study uh, context. So uh, a monoclonal antibody solution has been taken, stressed at different temperatures, and the results that have been ob obtained are the following. And here, thanks to the use of those response curves, you can see that uh, there is a difference in potency of, uh, of, the, of the antibody tested, and this is well in line with the amount of stress that uh, the different molecules underwent. So it seems that this, uh, this approach, as it is streamlined, no wash, and uh, potentially placed transposable, can be used not only to characterize mechanisms of action, but also to characterize the set of molecules in the context of salt degradation studies. As I told you at the beginning, it is important for us to uh, leverage all blood as a sample because this is potentially uh, a representativity of the heterogeneity that could someday be observed at the, at the patient level. So first of all, in the case of the extracellular uh, panel, you can see here this uh, histogram showing how much the NK cell activation phenotype does change as a function of the, of the donor that is being considered. In that case, 19, seven, 19 different donors have been considered, and the different colors really uh, correspond to the different phenotypes that have been observed. And what you can see, what is important to see, that there is a significant heterogeneity between these different donors, well, well illustrating the heterogeneity of each of response. This is true as well in the a level of depletion of the different uh, donor. You can see that most of the donor are about 50% of the B cell are more depleted, while some other doesn't show any uh, significant depletion of the B cell. In that case, what is interesting is that this donor is the one that shows the highest percentage of NK cells. We're all showing that each donor is unique and that this kind of thing can be grasped at this uh, functional uh, ASA uh, level. Finally, the last uh, uh, heterogeneity that you can see in the case of this panel is the level of CD54 on, uh, on monocyte. And as you can see, you have donor that doesn't show any evolution, while some other donors show twice as much uh, MFI of uh, CD54 on the monocyte after the incubation. This was for the extracellular panel, and the same question was being asked for the pro-inflammatory panel, if I can, if I can say. And what was really interesting to 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 see was the following: on about 20 donors that have been uh, that have been analyzed, three different subgroups of donors have been uh, have been detected. 
The first one, and this is the most uh, represented group of donors, are donors that only express IL-8 uh, significantly in response to a co-incubation with uh, obinutuzumab in that case. Then we have another set of donors that does not only produce IL-8 in response to uh, an incubation with the therapeutic, but also show a uh, really strong proportion or quantity of TNF alpha being produced. And finally, a last set of uh, last subgroup of donors that shows IL-8 production, TNF production, but also IL-6 production, well showing here that each donor might be different in the level of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines that they are producing upon stimulation with this one on IC20 antibody. This is bringing me to, uh, to the conclusion. And um, what uh, I wanted to show and what I hope I showed you is that uh, we are able to develop highly streamlined whole blood uh, functional assays to, that can be used to characterize biology in detail. They can be used to characterize mechanisms of action of uh, different molecules. They can be used to study molecules in the context of four degradation studies. And we believe that they can be really interesting and important tools in the context of assessing comparability between a biosimilar candidate and an originate molecule. And also, and this is really the most uh, important message here of, uh, of this uh, of this uh, webinar, maybe that this all blood, all blood uh, heterogeneity can be uh, can be honest. And the question relates to uh, the meaning of this uh, of this heterogeneity will be uh, the topic of further collaborative studies. And um, also, what we uh, what will do in uh, in the future is to try to apply the concept that we developed for anti C20 to other math family, for example, anti TNF might be one, and uh, and other potentials that we like to work in, in in collaboration. So this will be also as a function of the, the people we meet and discuss with in the future. So finally, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, people that did uh, take part to the study or that we had the, the pleasure to collaborate with uh, for generating this data. So these are Beckman Slaughter, uh, life sciences, uh, scientists, but also people at various institutions uh, in Europe, but also in, uh, in the US, and people from the, from the, from the biopharma field for the part of the uh, on anti C20. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marc, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, excellent information today, and we feel very grateful that you can share that with ourselves and with our audience today. Uh, we can tell from the audience feedback that we have uh, a good amount of interest. We have several wonderful questions. Uh, I'm going to give just a minute for our attendees to type in additional questions uh, using the question uh, tab on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we'll compile those questions in just one second and get a chance to answer as many of them as we can as time permits. So let's give everybody just a minute here. Okay. All right. Let's see. It looks like a lot of the questions that we have are centered around bats. Um, Jean-Marc, the, the, one of the questions from Michelle in Seattle is, uh, is new basophil activation dry tube, com excuse me, is it compatible with any cytometer? Uh, yes, so, uh, our tube has been designed to uh, to, to be compatible with uh, any classical uh, related equipped uh, cytometer, and uh, and there is uh, several of those on, on the market today. Yeah. So yeah, they are broadly compatible. Fantastic. Uh, another question: We have two or three questions around bat, so let's stick with those. Uh, one is: How fresh should the blood for bat be? Uh, so this has been well uh, documented over the past few years. So it is um, uh, 
it is preferable to work with uh, with fresh blood, so basically ideal blood that could have been drawn during the, the day. Most of the time we're working with, with blood that is uh, yeah, between uh, zero and four to five hours of, of age. It can work beyond that, but then you can expect a decrease of reactivity. Excellent. Hope that answers the question there. And we've got Andy from the UK asking, does your stimulation buffer for BAT include IL-3? No, no, there is uh, no IL-3 in, uh, in the buffer. So basically in the, in, the, in the product that we just launched, there is, when you're using heteronite uh, blood, you simply need to be using PBS, so no specific uh, activation molecules, I can say. In case you're using uh, EDTA and psychoagulated blood, you would use our stimulation buffer. In that case, uh, it only contains calcium in, uh, in the buffer. So this is basically uh, to put that calcium at the physiological level uh, to get everything working. But no ion treat, only calcium and heparin. All right, great. Um, let's see. We've got three or four more questions. I'm trying to find the most relevant ones here. Uh, uh, have you been working with other therapeutic monoclonal antibodies other than CD20, other than anti-CD20? So, um, so this is basically evolving as it uh, as it goes. Uh, we did start uh, working with anti CD20s as uh, I showed uh, today. Uh, then we, we started working on anti TNF because this is a, a very interesting uh, family with a lot of heterogeneity in terms of mechanisms of action and also a, a lot of molecules currently available. And uh, and we've also been started working with anti CD38, but this is basically as uh, at the discussion level uh, that we uh, switch to one or the other, and it seems that this uh, approach is really applicable. And of course, we need to be tuned afterwards with a specific marker of interest for each of the, of the antibodies. Uh, okay, great. And then uh, there was a follow-up question here. Someone was asking, uh, in the case that I want to use another molecule, can I add another antibody during the first incubation? So you mean uh, if it is another staining uh, region, so another staining molecule, that would be, uh, I believe, uh, the question. If so, uh, during the incubation, you can uh, you can add a variety of staining. You just have to make sure that uh, you know the the antigen you're looking at is compatible with the fix and white uh, approach that is uh, that is being used. But yes, uh, creativity here is uh, is permitted for sure. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, let's see, uh, I'm mean, seeing a question here, is co is complement-dependent cytotoxicity occurring in any of your approaches? So uh, this was a question we were we were playing with uh, at the beginning and actually working with the uh, Nutrexinab uh, that is highly dependent on the, um, the CD16 phenotype. So basically for Nutrexinab, you do have some, uh, some people that won't be able to get their NK engaged because they would have a FF a phenotype, for example, on the CD16. And in that case, we've been able to, uh, to, to, to show uh, a significant B cell depletion, which basically means indirectly that CDC is happening in our situation. Okay, great. We, uh, we have a question here from Jen asking, uh, do you see the flow cytometry allergen test replacing the skin test and do you anticipate educating clinicians to interpret the results? So, um, in that case, I think, and this is really the, the way the field is taken. We know that the sensitivity or the specificity of skin prick testing is not uh, as ideal as it could be. And, and this is why it is usually acknowledged that it can benefit from other approaches. So, I more see BAT as uh, uh, an, ad an additional approach to complement the current uh, allergy testing landscape. And this is really uh, the way it's going. So I think now that the approach is democratized, we'll see more and more uh, people using this approach, hopefully. And then the true usefulness of this approach would be, uh, would be challenged. But I think each of the current testing present their own advantages. And each should be used in a complementary fashion. But, uh, the, the, the biggest hope with uh, the activation testing is that we could potentially decrease the number of oral food challenges, at least positive oral food challenges, because unless 
as long as that you would have a strong reactivity, ex vivo, you would basically, you won't basically be going to, to, to challenges. So this is the biggest hope here with PET, to reduce the number of challenges. Uh, fantastic. Uh, let's see, uh, just putting the word out there, we have about three or four minutes left, so if there are additional questions, please keep typing them in here. I've got a, uh, another question here. Does the observed whole blood heterogeneity correlate with any particular patient's conditions? So uh, this, is, uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, a great question, and this is what we are what we're really uh, enthusiastic uh, about. So to, to answer this, we, we did start to, to work with uh, a few clinicians, and we have uh, several pilot studies uh, going on. So we are not there yet, but uh, this is what, uh, where we expect to go in the future. But of course, uh, this needs further collaborative work with clinicians interested in the concept, and, uh, and so on. So, uh, we hope to, uh, to, to, to bring additional answers to this question in the next uh, uh, couple of, uh, yeah, in the future, near future, hopefully. Great. Uh, let's see, maybe the last question that I have received so far is from Mariana uh, asking, did you try this approach with cryopreserved blood? So, uh, we've not been using cryopreserved uh, blood, uh, at least. Not for, for this, uh, for this essay. What we've been doing, and this is really in the context of multicentric uh, studies, we've been, um, looking really carefully at the post staining stability of, uh, sample, uh, post uh, activation. What we've been able to show recently is that once, uh, the, 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 the basic fields have been uh, activated and once the blood has been lysed, because of the live dissolution that we're using, uh, we are able to preserve the sample for a duration up to three or five days. And this time should enable us to basically send samples from a clinical center to a central lab under, uh, you know, um, control condition two to eight degrees, for, for example. And it appears that this is at least an intermediate solution to, uh, to enable multi-centric studies to be, uh, to be at the most, uh, um, a bit more easily. But cryopreserved blood, is a uh, yeah a, a stretch group for uh, right now and uh, no we've not been working on these uh, extreme conditions so far okay excellent well that's the end of the questions that we have received uh so i just want to close up by saying thank you very much john mark for presenting this information uh thank you to our floor finder audience for attending our, our goal at Flora Finder here is to, to bring people as much information as they need at their fingertips to design excellent flow cytometry panels quickly. And these webinars are a nice way to bring additional information beyond that. And we really appreciate uh, Beckman Coulter and John Mark for, for presenting this information. Uh, should mention that a link to this recording will be sent out soon to all participants and everyone who registered. Um, feel free to send any additional questions that you have that were not addressed to support at florafinder.com, and we'll get those questions forwarded to the appropriate person at Beckman or to Jean-Marc. Um, and that's really all. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.